Thanks for the introduction. So my name is Pedro, and I'm going to talk about this concept that we call proprioceptive interaction. And this is work I did with my advisor, Patrick Bodish, at the House of Blood Institute. So let me just show you a brief moment of video. And let me point out that the interesting part here is that I'm actually not moving the slider, but that slider is moving me instead. And so what we're going to talk today about is interfaces that talk directly to the user's body. And we kind of get through it and understand what it means. But it comes from this trend that we see in mobile and wearable computing in which the interface size or the form factor of our devices that we have in our pocket is not directly dictated by the electronics or the battery or anything like that, but merely by the size of the input and output space, which in the case of a smartphone is obviously the touch screen. And in the case of the smartwatch, is also the display that you have on the smartwatch. So if you think and plot this, there's obviously a loss in ability. We're talking about devices that have a lesser vocabulary, but we're talking about devices that are very mobile. And we're kind of probing that space over there after the smartwatch and wondering what's out there, what happens after we have a device that is so small that we can no longer have a visual component there. So there's no display, of course, in the, the work we're talking here. And many researchers have asked this question, and they ask the question in phrases such as, how can we feel for the missing display? And of course, haptics is a solution, but we're particularly interested in proposing a new type of interaction modality here to kind of propose an eyes-free interaction that fills that space for the missing visuals. So let me run the video again, and now I'm going to explain what's actually going to happen. So the device is outputting a value by controlling my wrist. It's pushing my wrist up, and I feel that value as it goes through. Now I'm going to input something to the computer, such as a value, I'm going to push it down. I'm going to say it's zero now. Now if that value kind of changes over time, the device comes back again to me and tells me, hey, the value is changing, and here's how it looks now. And again, takes over and moves my wrist up to kind of show me the new value. The way we're achieving this is by a wearable bracelet that achieves this concept and it reads and writes to the, here, the user, my muscles. It does so by outputting a value, as you just saw, by using electrical stimulation as in a manner to turn my wrist up and the angle is kind of the new value that I'm perceiving. And I can input as well, right? I can control the computer by moving my wrist, which the device senses using an accelerometer to measure the angle of my wrist. So that's kind of the basis of what I'm talking about today, and which we call proprioceptive interaction. Is the idea that you kind of control the computer, but also respond, feel the response of the computer, using merely the pose of your own body. So it's not a visual manner, or it's not an auditory, or don't feel vibrotactile stimuli, or anything like that. It's merely simply kind of feeling the pose of your own body. So let me kind of break down the, the definition of proprioceptive interaction in sort of a simple diagram you have the user on the left and you have the device on the right. But the truth is, the device that we we're talking about should be in the middle. That's my hand or my wrist angle, if you will. Because the device over there on the right side, that was merely a hardware component that supports purpose-heavy interaction, but it's not the interactive device. So, okay, we got the hand that is an interactive device. So how do I control my hand? Well, everybody knows how the, kind of the body works. I use my muscles and my nerves to kind of reposition my wrist. As I do that, I immediately know, I can prove to you right now that I know where my wrist is, and I feel that through my proprioceptive system. Right? There's spindles connected to my tendons and to my muscles that inform my brain how my angle is on my wrist. That's just how the body works, nothing new here. Now what I think is kind of interesting and new is that other side, the machine side on the right. So when I move to kind of input to the device, I'm just happily inputting, the system figures out that using an accelerometer and the angle is the new value. Now when the system wants to tell me a new value, it does so by posing my wrist, by changing the angle of my wrist, causing an involuntary contraction using electrical muscle stimulation, which then, and that's kind of the kicker here, I perceive using the proprioceptive system again. So there's kind of a double loop with the proprioceptive system, and that's why we're calling this proprioceptive interaction, right? Because that closes the loop between the user and the machine on that side. All right, so I'm going to show you an example of me actually using this. So here, I'm giving a talk and I'm playing a video during that time. And the video playback position will be rendered on my wrist as my wrist goes up slowly as the video plays. But I'm still in control and if I rewind my wrist or I just push it down, the video rewinds. So this is the idea that the wrist and the video are kind of one. 
And I can also just simply dismiss the device by doing any other motion that is not within the axis of the accelerometer. All right. So from kind of a interaction techniques perspective, the usability benefit of using proper receptor interaction, although the kind of vocabulary we're talking about here is very reduced and very simplistic, is that it frees up the other senses, right? So in what you just saw, I'm giving a talk similar to this, and I can focus on my primary task, which is doing this and not controlling the video, but still allows me to maintain eye contact, right? I was looking at that colleague that was asking me a question, so I wasn't really worried about the wearable device that I was wearing. And it's also years free because there was no need for auditory input or output to tell me where I am in which part of the video. So now there's a second part of the story, which is why we are so interested in proper receptive interaction. And I think it's because we're kind of discovering this new type of interaction modality that is at first sort of a very, very close integration with a human body and with the user. Because in a way, you're partially lending part of your body to become the device. And in doing so, there's this question of the, de the device becoming an interface. And we find that kind of exciting. And I think um, that's kind of a, one of the possible directions for post-wearable interfaces. So we're actually building on a lot of research that comes from um, eyes free um, and kind of wearable output, such as sticking a vibrotactile actuator in your pocket, such as finding your phone. And of course, this is sort of a simple, simplistic way of communication that offers um, eyes free output. And people have done that in a more expressive setting using such as uh, the musical vibrotactile glove by Huang and Ted Sterner that is more expressive kind of because it's an array of vibrotactile cells. But also like we've gone to this and a couple of years back with gesture output and try to like not stay only on the output side but merge output and input in a symmetric device. This was a device that was able to do both things, input and output, and kind of in the same space. And this is sort of the, the thing that inspired us to, to build proper set interaction, this kind of shared space between users and devices. And now of course we're also basing on the idea that we can actuate in users' muscles using electrical muscle stimulation. And that comes from the 60s in rehabilitation theory. And of course, this EMS found its way into this great work possessed hand by Yun Rakimoto and Tamaki, also here at Kai, as a training system to teach you new gestures while you play a musical instrument. And we use that as well for a particular wearable and compact form factor of force feedback here at Kai a couple of years back. On the sensing side, and you've seen this in a lot of talks today, EMG offers a lot of possibilities for eyes free input. So that's also kind of what we're building at. And piecing all these things together, what you can actually see is that it allows us to form a basis for the hardware in which we create a proper set interaction. Which is again the idea that only by muscle poses you can kind of interact input and output. So what you've seen so far while I was kind of like scrubbing through that video and the slider and I were tracking at the same time is that we were sharing the same channel. We're calling that symmetric interaction, uh, symmetric proper set interaction kind of a reference to gesture output. But nothing says in the concept that we need to be on the same limb. If we split, so on the left side, you have me with accelerometer controlling something, and on the right side, the device is outputting into another arm, we can kind of think of that as an asymmetric interaction, in which I have two limbs doing different things. And I'll show you an example here. <coughs> this is Patrick Yonel, this is one of my co-authors. He's gonna play a children's game that you might know, it's called Slapsies or Red Hands two people and you have to slap each other's hands. He's going to play that alone. And you can already see that he's in kind of this asymmetric pose. Because one of the hands is computer, one of the hands is Patrick. So Patrick's basically trying to avoid the computer hand to slap him. It's very hard to play actually. So you can kind of see already the asymmetry happening, right? That is the hand that is being controlled by the computer. And the sensing device actually changed in this particular, that's a kind of a technical difference because we're no longer looking at like the angle variation in the pose. We're just looking at a collision to see if there was like a, a loss in the score of the game. So we fitted a microphone just as you saw in Batsy's talk with its M MMG sensor basically in the wrist to kind of compute that collision. All right, so um, another one that I can show you quickly is Yet another example of, of kind of a perceptive asymmetric interaction this is a game called Imaginary Palm, and this is my co-author Alex playing the game. Alexandra.
right? What happens here in the game is that the computer hand is kind of serving an imaginary ball. You can kind of imagine the trajectory of the ball. And with the other hand, which has an accelerometer, input hand, you kind of have to catch there as fast as you can to kind of receive the ball on time. And then another ball is served by the computer hand. And once again, I think this illustrates the asymmetry quite well, right? One hand is inputting, the other hand is receiving output from the computer. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the implementation quickly that allows us to create purpose-centered interaction. So the device that we build is a bracelet that has like all these three different shells and they kind of host the embedded electronics within. If we kind of open up and reveal the bracelet, this is how it looks like here on the left side. And it has one unit with only batteries, unit with a voltage regulator and a switch that's kind of empty for now. And there's one with an Arduino and Bluetooth that's the microcontroller and kind of the, the brain of the whole device. And then the kicker there, of course, is the EMS, the electric, electronic muscle stimulator, which also is being controlled dynamically by the devices and to regulate at each step the power amplitude that goes through the electrodes, kind of to regulate how much intensity uh, of your contraction. Then, of course, you wear electrodes on your muscles that deliver these contractions. And um, there's an accelerometer used on the limb that is being moved. Now, this is one particular implementation that you've seen so far. And as you saw through the talks today, everybody kind of believes in, in this idea that with there's much more like sort of a wearable potential with um, muscle interfaces such as EMG electromyography. And we also kind of started doing that um, already in the paper. And we added this EMG controller there on the right side, which allows us to get rid of the accelerometer in a way. And so far, we only went to the implication steps. But this in the future could be a very elegant way to kind of implement the proprioceptive interaction device because it allows you to have sort of an invisible computer because there will be no kind of accelerometer in your hand. Everything will be done with muscle sensing directly on the muscles that you're stimulating. So how does this actually work? This video just illustrates a little bit. So the data of the accelerometer is measured against the tilt, the gravity factor essentially, so that's pretty reliable. Once you invoke, you see immediately that on the oscilloscope, this is the EMS signal that's going to you. And there's a control loop, a PID control loop, that every single step kind of regulates the current that is needed to make you go to the next step. As you push down, you actually see a moment that the control loop takes to stabilize. And there it goes again, kind of figuring out what's the correct intensity for the next step. We also found that without the control loop, it was kind of hard because as you've seen in previous talks as well, muscle motion is not particularly linear, so you definitely need to have a PID control in the loop. All right. I'm just going to skip through this. This just basically shows you what I just saw, right? So if you don't have this PID controller, what happens is that you totally overshoot. This is you basically doing a linear control, right? Putting just as much as, as you think it should be. And you kind of overshoot, so you go from this to that in a split second. And with a kind of PID controller or any type of other uh, mechanical control loop, what you have is a tight control loop there in the middle. And you see how much I've actually need to change in the EMS current to get there. All right, so more interestingly, is we wanted to validate this approach. And we particularly were interested in understanding if users can perceive this inner loop or not. Like if we stimulate them through proprioceptive feedback by electrical muscles posing their arm in a particular way, can they recap that, right? So they could, could they rewind the video and so forth and understand that particular part of proprioceptive interaction? So what we asked users to do is to sit there and they, without seeing, so there's this blank division there, Without seeing, they felt their arms going to a particular target, and then we asked them to repose that target after a while. So I'll just show you how it actually feels from a participant perspective. Electrical muscle stimulation puts your hand in a particular target. We turn that off, take a picture, record accelerometer data, and we ask you to repose. You confirm using a keyboard when you feel that that's the position that you worked for, take a picture, record accelerometer data. Here's the raw data and pictures just so you can see it. You can see that people are pretty good at doing that. And they're particularly pretty good for all the angles. Of course, the, the, as further you go, it gets a little bit more complicated. But what's interesting is that we found an average accuracy of 5.8 degrees, which kind of validates mechanically that this approach works for something like scrubbing a video. Now, we were also interested in digging a little bit more deeper into that what I touched before, which is this kind of odd perspective that proprioceptive interaction devices offer, in which you're sharing part of your body with a device and it's becoming the device. So we're interested in how do actually users feel when they're using such a device. 
So we ask participants to play the game that you just saw, this kind of red hand slapsies for one person. I'll just run the video and I'll tell you a little bit of what happened. So we found that people were very interested in the concept and they found the concept both interesting with a muscle output, but also found it um, kind of an interesting experience. They actually rated it 4.6 out of 5 in a likelihood scale. We also found that 7 out of the 12 people reported several times that they were playing against themselves, which we found kind of interesting given that there was nothing mentioned about that. Also, all the participants kind of interchanged throughout this experience the words me and computer several times. They would say stuff, stuff like, I'm playing against the computer and it's really hard to win. And later they would say, this is really frustrating because I know that I'm losing against my own hand or something like that. And they would just interchange that throughout the experience. So kind of to wrap up today's talk, we've kind of introduced the concept of proprioceptive interaction. And that's the idea of rather than using dis visual displays or auditory or vibro tactile, you just input and output and you perceive that through the pose of your own body. And we kind of particularly think this is exciting because this could be the post wearable devices world in which interfaces are very small, they're kind of hidden, and they fuse with the body and that's what allows them to kind of go post wearable. And um, just before I kind of wrap the talk, I want to ask, um, Word of appreciation, I give a word of appreciation to my co authors that's Alexandra, um, Yon, Bidimula, Daniel Hoffman, Roger Cunell, and Patrick Bodish. And I would love to take your questions. Thank you. Well, I'm going to take the State University. So, you suppose that all subjects are cooperative. Let's say if I'm not cooperating with the devices, the current increasing, or what is yeah. happening? No, that's a, that's a great question. So when you start, the first time you use the device, and in that case we did a calibration step, which is sort of to say like what's the minimum and maximum values that you're going to kind of withstand that you find totally pain-free. Within those pain-free ranges, that's what the device will operate. So indeed, if the device wants to output a 99% value, it will push up. If you're tensing more, it will push up until that value that you set is a totally pain-free experience. Okay. So that's kind of how it goes. It's always between those, those values, yeah. Great talk, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Hi, uh, Graham Wilson from the University of Glasgow. So in your first user study, um, did you get an idea of what angle the participants thought their hand was at? Or were they just effectively matching the muscle tension? Yeah, so we ran different pilots, but that's one of the things we wanted to try out and we ended up not doing that. But so we, we basically at this stage we asked them to repose. I guess that would be the, the next step, to also ask them, tell us which level you think you are. Um, that could be an interesting thing to also understand, yeah. But yes. we didn't, we didn't, run, we don't have that data at this point. Yeah. Thanks. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's thank all the speakers again. <laughs> and thank you for coming to this session.